Good morning, everybody. Welcome all those of you who are watching this, joining us on YouTube. This is the 5.30 a.m. Friday morning weekly priestly discipleship with Flame Keepers. If you want to take a look in the description box below, you will see a link that can take you to our website. For those of you who can't rise early and join us live, um, actually, speaking of Flame Keepers, before we get started, I want to just do a quick share screen and take everybody uh, to the, the Flame Keepers website in case you want to join any of our live online events. Um, all you got to do is come to flame-keepers.com right here. This will take you to the uh, Flame Keepers website, and you come to our Zoom rosaries. Now, actually, we're going to change this link to say Zoom calendar. So our tech, our tech genius who's with us today with the cute little white dog up there, she's our tech genius. If we could change that link to Zoom calendar, but you come here to our Zoom calendar, and if you ever want to join us live online for any type of event, whether it's a Zoom rosary, uh, whether it's weekly priestly discipleship with Father Vidal, or we also have uh, on Sundays, you can see right here, beginning this weekend uh, at 7.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Father Dominic uh, from the Madeline in Salt Lake City will be doing a fireside chat discussing the readings from the, the Mass on that Sunday. But this is how you can connect with us online. You can click on any of these events and the Zoom links are found inside. You're welcome to come pray with us at any point. Also, if you want to join Flame Keepers, a live event, uh, we have daily, if you look here, daily, weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly ways that you can connect with us, as well as an annual retreat. Just come to the flame-keepers.com webpage, click on events. And in fact, um, I believe we have a, what we call a monthly fire pit. This is a, a, a an evening potluck. And uh, our next monthly fire pit will be in Orem on May 16th. So Jericho, hopefully we'll see you at the potluck. We didn't see you at the last one. But uh, you can come to events, go to Monthly Fire Pit. We have one in Orem. And then in Malad, Idaho on June 6th. In fact, in Malad, we'll be celebrating Mass, followed by a potluck afterwards. But in Orem, we'll be at Father Vidal's house. You got the address right there. Um, if you're looking for any Flame Keeper locations, we're kind of all over Utah and, and slightly into Idaho right now. So anyways, that's the website, flame-keepers.com. You can also get there through uh, zoomrosary.com. And we're going to get started in a second, but before we do, I just want to open up with a little bit of prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. Uh, we thank you. So uh, this morning, we're going to be going through uh, this weekly priestly discipleship with Father Gustavo Vidal. He is the lead pastor of St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church in Orem, Utah. Uh, we are part of the Diocese of Salt Lake City, and this begins today, the first week of a 10 week journey every other Friday morning uh, through uh, basically spiritual disciplines for the Christian life. And so, uh, Father Vidal, if you would like to um, give a little context or take over, we just want to toss this baton to you right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So we are going to be following uh, this uh, wonderful book. It's called um, spiritual direction is about Henry Nguyen, and I'm going to say just a few things about him. Um, he's a beloved author, priest, and internationally recognized spiritual master, counselor, and guide offers gentle wisdom for the universal questions of spiritual life. Who am I? Where have I been? 
and where I am going, who is God for me, where do I belong, how can I be of service. As a priest, pastor, and professor of spirituality at Notre Dame, Yale, and Harvard, Henry Nguyen offers spiritual direction to many students, but his famous course on spiritual, spiritual direction was never recorded during his lifetime. Now in spiritual direction, the first of a series, one of Henry's students, Michael Christensen, and one of his editors, Rebecca Laird, have developed the, uh, his courses and practice of spiritual direction into a book of profound wisdom for living and deep spiritual life. Um, I, I think that this book was printed in 2006 or something like that, but I want to go to the, it's not the introduction, it's one, some of the, it's, one, it's called The Prophets. What is this book about? Because I think it's important to understand um, what, the, what the book will have, contain, entail, develop the principal ideas. Um, because if we understand that, then we will go in the right direction. Uh, one of the things, um, how Henry, how did he understand spiritual direction? At the beginning, when he was a newly ordained uh, priest, he saw spiritual direction as a formal relationship for supervision and accountability between a mature spiritual leader and a new priest or minister. Later in his life, he preferred the term spiritual friendship or soul friend which conveyed the necessary give and take in the process of spiritual accountability and faith formation. What does that mean to have a spiritual direction, a director, I mean? It's, a, it's somebody that you can talk to, that you can pray with about your life and the issues that you're going through probably at that moment in your existence. So it's very important to have a spiritual direct, director. So the spiritual direction as he understood it can be defined as this. It is a relationship initiated by a spiritual seeker who finds a mature person of faith willing to pray and respond with wisdom and understanding to his or her questions about how to live spiritually in a world of ambiguity and distraction. One of the requirements, one of the things that are very important to have a spiritual life is to have solitude. If you want to be either a spiritual director or you want to have a spiritual director, you have to have solitude in your life. It is virtually impossible to live your spiritual life without solitude. Although we need solitude to know God, we require a faithful community to hold us accountable. We need to learn how to listen to the word of God ever, ever present within our hearts. And basically um, in this book, he is also outlining three things that we need for that to take place, okay? So the first one is that we need disciplines of study and spiritual practice to discern the word of God in words of scripture. So we really have to read the word of God. We have to allow the word of God to shape us. We have to open to the word of God. We need to develop a discipline to read the word of God because it is through his word that God is going to speak to us. There is no other way. You are not going to have dreams. Some people do, though. Uh, you are not going to have apparitions. 
mainly the way how God speaks to us is through his holy word. So we need to create um, a habit of reading the word, but also uh, listening to the word. And that's why we Christian Catholics do what we do at the celebration of the sacraments, especially the celebration of the mass. There is nothing else and there is nothing more important during the mass that to proclaim the word of God. It is essential because the word of God has shaped the life of a whole nation, Israel in the Old Testament. And also the word of God has shaped the life of the church for 2000 years so far. The second thing that we need is a church or faith community that provides opportunities for worshiping and sharing, engaging in mutual correction and bearing of burdens, confessing faults, offering forgiveness and celebrating life. It would be impossible to, um, to encounter God just by listening or reading the word of God. We also encounter God in the midst of our brothers and sisters. It is there where God also reveals himself to us. And this is a very beautiful, um, powerful thing because as people of faith, we come to worship him. As people of faith, we come to share our lives. As people of faith, we come to engage uh, in mutual correction. And also we bear each other's burdens. Um, it is in the community that we confess our faults. Um, it is um, by being with others, how uh, we are able to forgive and also we are able to be forgiven as well. Um, all of that will bring us to the most important thing and that is celebrating life. And that's why the community is so important. Uh, we see that in the gospels, uh, Jesus is the origin and is the cause of the community. He's the foundation of the community. Remember that he called at the 12th, um, at the beginning of his ministry. So he, can, he was able to teach them um, everything about the Father's will and also to show them how this God is. And this God is in a very profound um, relationship. He wants to be in a very profound relationship with the people. And that's why he's choosing or he's chosen those 12, 12 guys because he wanted to bond with them. He wanted to create a community. Um, and what this book is describing is what Jesus himself did as a teacher, as a rabbi, as a spiritual leader for his disciples and of course for his church. Okay, the third thing that is important to stress here is also that we need guides, spiritual friends, a spiritual director or a spiritual accountability group that can function for us as a safe place to bear our souls. Uh, this is very crucial too, especially uh, we need to create the environment where things that are being shared will not be uh, leaking or will not be shared with other people. Um, that's why when we do the retreat, the men's retreat um, from the very beginning, one of the things that I stressed so much is that whatever is being said there stays there and nobody can share that to anybody else. Because I think it's important to create the environment where trust can be built. If the trust is not there, then people are not willing to take the risk. People are not willing to open up. People are not willing to unveil their secrets. People are not able to, uh, they're not going to be willing to 
um, to let others come into the mystery of who they are. And remember, that is very sacred. When we are able to enter into somebody's life, it's a very sacred thing. And I feel privileged as a priest because I do that in conf confession and that's what confession is. And one of the things that happened there is that when people come to confession, they open up themselves and they, you are able, as a confessor, you are able to see the real person, you know, there is nothing fake about the person when they're confessing. And that's when they become the most vulnerable. And you have to be very careful because when you become the most vulnerable, that's when you are the weakest. And so uh, you have to be very careful because you can be taken advantage of when that happens. But of course, if we understand what spiritual direction is and what confession is, of course, that we are going to be able to respect that relationship that is given to us. Um, and has been given to us through the church and throughout the centuries. So do you guys any, do you have any questions so far? Because I just did the introduction and I'm going to be, mo be moving into the uh, chapter one, who will answer my questions? Does anybody have any questions so far? Uh, I just real quick, Father, wanna just give a quick context to this. So this book, Spiritual Direction, is also the book that we're going to be kind of using as the center of our attention at the annual retreat in August. Although this uh, Zoom meeting is open to everybody from men, women, for, from everything, though this is also preparation for a men's retreat. Uh, what's interesting about this book is that, and I know you're aware of this, but for those who are joining us on, on YouTube later on who are just getting to know Flame Keepers, you know, we have three things that we focus on, which you just described in that book. You you broke it down into these three disciplines of prayer. Uh, you called it solitude, uh, the word of God, reading the Bible, hearing the Bible, going to mass and hearing the readings. And then uh, the, so the word of God. And then we say relationships. And the way you said that was the faith community and spiritual guides and safe places for us to interact and have life together. And I just think that's awesome. That's part of why we're utilizing this particular book is, is because this, this priest um, broke down kind of the, the basics of spiritual disciplines into those three categories, which just happen to be the categories that we focus on. I just want to point that out. That's really awesome that there's such a correlation there. Perfect. Okay. So when we come to spiritual direction, also um, we have questions about uh, the most important issues in our lives. Like at the beginning I was saying, when I was doing the introduction to this book is who am I? Where have I been and where I am going? Who is God for me? Where do I belong? How can I be of service? Those can be some of the most important fundamental questions for a person. And of course, they are not the only ones. They, they can be other questions, you know. Um, like, for example, about suffering. Uh, the way that we understand suffering, especially when somebody is going through a physical illness, when somebody has lost a loved one, um, there is emotional suffering. There is so many other different kinds of suffering. So those are questions that are very fundamental to us, to people. And the first chapter of this book is talking about the who will answer my questions. So one of the things that is brought up here is that seeking spiritual direction means to ask the big questions, the fundamental questions, the universal ones, and the context of a supportive community. In order to answer those questions or to look for an answer, there are some requirements that need to be there. So we need to ask God's spirit to guide us. And we need to be guided to the right place 
So hopefully those questions will be answered. They may not be answered at all. You can live your life throughout um, without having any of the answers, I mean, any of the questions answered in your life. So in order for this to take place, you, you need um, to, to have discipline and to have courage. And one of the uh, gospels that talk about that is Matthew 7, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask, seek, knock until the, the, doors, the door opens. So that's very important to have that in your life. Um, then the book goes into what questions are people what questions are people asking? You may not be able to formulate an ultimate life question right now. Sometimes we feel so much fear and anxiety and identify so closely with our suffering that our pains mark masks the questions. Once pain or confusion is framed or articulated by a question, it must be lived rather than answered. The first task of seeking guidance then is to touch your own struggles, doubts, and insecurities. In short, to affirm your life as a quest. Your life, my life, is given graciously by God. Our lives are not promised to be solved, but journeys to be taken with Jesus as our friend and finest guide. If you go to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, there is a beautiful text that we have spoken about before. And that is um, when the disciples are going to Emmaus um, from Jerusalem. And they're walking along the way and Jesus appears. Um, they're discussing about the things that had taken place in Jerusalem. And so Jesus is asking the question, what are you guys talking about? And so one of the disciples says, um, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that doesn't know what had happened um, in Jerusalem? Um, and so they start talking about what took place. But that text is a very beautiful, powerful example of what we are talking or the book is talking about here because Jesus appears as they are on a journey to Emmaus. And in fact, that text is talking about the Eucharist, the first part of the gospel of that passage talks about how Jesus breaks open the scriptures and how the disciples are able to understand the word of God. And that's what happens at mass. So the first part of the mass is the reading the liturgy of the word of God. And it's a very beautiful thing because it is God who enters into the lives of the disciples. It's God who enters into our lives. And he is there. And the only thing that we have to do is really to share with him our struggles, our doubts, our insecurities. And so that's what Jesus does. And thus, if you want to be guided, if you want to be taken to the place where God wants you to go, then that's what you need to do. The other beautiful text is found in the Gospel of John in chapter 20, when, they, when Jesus appears the day of the resurrection to the disciples. Remember that passage. It's, it's a very beautiful passage. All of them are there gathered. But the only one that is missing is Thomas. Remember that text? And then a week after, um, on that day, the day when Jesus rose from the dead, Thomas is there. But Thomas is having a problem. He's struggling with his faith. It's a very powerful text because that's what spiritual direction is all about. It's bringing 
your doubts, even doubting in the existence of God is addressed in the Gospels. And Thomas is the great example of that. Even when you are a person of faith, there are moments in your life that you are going to have doubts in your life, that you are going to wonder if God is there or not there, that you're praying for something, that you're seeking something, that you, are, that you have a special need and you see no answer at all. And it seems like God is deaf or God is not paying attention or God is too busy, busy to listen to you. And I think that that's a very beautiful text because many times a lot of us go through moments in our lives where we kind of doubt about the existence of God. So that's what spiritual direction is all about, okay? It's bringing all those things, your doubts, your struggles, your insecurities, okay? Remember, our lives are not problems to be solved, but journeys to be taken with Jesus as our friend and finest guide. This is where the ministry of spiritual direction, along with other interpersonal disciplines of the spiritual life, preaching, teaching, counseling, and pastoral care can help. All those things are very, very important because then we can re realize that we are not alone on this journey, that there are other people that have the same questions, they have the same struggles, that they are on the same boat as we are. And that's why one of those three fundamental things that I was talking about before is so important and you need to have it there because the community um, relationships are the ones that are going to support you, are the ones that are going to be there for you, um, you are going to be shaped by God through those people that you're sharing your spiritual life with. And it's very important to have that in your life. Um, another point that is very important is when God speaks to, and he's given an example of um, in, in scriptures in the Old Testament job, is that he says, where were you there when I stopped the waters and they issued gushing from the womb? When I wrapped the ocean in clouds and swirled the sea in, in shadows, have you seen the gates of death or stood at the gates of doom? This is Job uh, chapter 38. When God sounds through, God speaks through a question that reveals the unspeakable mystery of creative eternal love. And what the book is trying to tell us here also is that when we are going through, going through struggles in life, when we don't see the end of the tunnel, something incredible happens is that God's love is there. Many times, and most of the time, people don't realize that God is there. Why? Because we are so wrapped up in pain, the worries, all those things that happen in life. And we fail to see and to recognize that God is present there. If you are open enough and if you are really seeking the presence of God in your life, then at some point in that journey on, during that struggle, during that difficulty in your life, God is going to reveal himself to you. And God is allowing you to go through that because he's affirming his presence in your life. Um, 
One of the passages that come to mind is when um, the disciples are on the boat and there is a storm in the lake, remember? And Jesus appears there. And so Peter says, he recognizes that it is Jesus. And so Peter is asking the Lord, Lord, command that I walk towards you. Remember that passage is a very beautiful, powerful passage. And so the reason why that passage is there is to illustrate, to teach us that as Peter, we also go through stormy times in our lives. And when uh, at, the, at the word of Jesus, at the command of the Lord, Peter starts walking on the water. But remember, there is a storm. And so Peter gets caught up in the storm. And what happens? He is filled with, um, he's afraid. And then he loses his attention in Jesus. And he gets caught up in the storm. And that's why he starts sinking. That beautiful passage is there to tell us also that there are storms that come our way. We get caught up on them and we lose sight of God. God is always there for us. But one of the things that Jesus is doing is that in a way he wants Peter to go through that experience. He wants Peter to sink into the water, not because he wants Peter to drown, but he wants Peter to learn to trust in him. He wants Peter to keep his, his sight on the Lord, to keep his focus on Jesus. And this is what happens in spiritual life. Because many of those questions are not going to come because you have a perfect life. Like he was saying in the book at the beginning, you know, the most fundamental questions are coming because you're searching, because you're looking, because you're seeking, because you are not satisfied, because you want something in you, because there is something missing in your life, because there is something that is lacking in your heart. That's why you are always looking. You're always looking for something. And you know, um, when, when you uh, think about it, that's how God has made us. And basically, we are made with, um, there are two fundamental human needs that we were created with. And those two fundamental needs are to love, to love, and to be loved. That's what is going to satisfy the quench that we have. That's why people go out there looking for things that they may think are going to fulfill them, and they're not. Drugs, sex, any kind of addictions, you name it. There is a list of things out there. But the only one that will be able to satisfy our wants, our longings, our deepest human desires is God. And that's why we are doing this book, basically. It's because we are people we are a community that are seeking this God, that are looking, that are longing for this relationship. 
And the only way that we are going to be satisfied actually is in a relationship with Jesus, because that's, where, that's how we were created. We were created to be in, in relationship. From the very beginning of creation, that's how God created us. And one of the things that sin destroyed totally was that. So that's why we have broken relationships. That's why we are always seeking for something. Is because of that. That's why I am so, um, I am always excited when I read and I preach on the Gospel of John in chapter 4, when Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman. Um, really, the Samaritan woman is there in the Gospel of John to represent every one of us. Because what the book is describing is what the Samaritan woman is going through. So we have this God that comes to the well, and we have that woman that is there. And actually, when God encounters the woman, the Samaritan woman, uh, he is encountering humanity. And when the Samaritan woman is encountering Jesus, it's humanity that is humanity that is encountering this God. And so in this conversation that takes place there at the well, he reveals himself as the one that can satisfy the longings, the deepest desires that the woman has. There is nobody else. And he reveals himself as the living water. And she understands that. And as she understands that he is the living water, she becomes desperate in a way. And she says, oh, I want this living water. Where do I go to have this living water? And then Jesus says, I am the living water. So all her quench, all her desires, her longing, longings are met in Jesus, the Lord. Because he's the only one that can fulfill her. And in that relationship or in that dialogue that takes place there, you know, God reveals not only himself, but also is able in, to enter into the human mystery. So he reveals to her who she is. And he tells her, you know, you have had five husbands. And the one that you have right now is not your husband. And so she goes nuts. And in a way, this God enters into our vulnerability. This God is able to see the weakest part of our being. And one of the things that this God sees and does when he encounters us there at that moment in our lives is that he loves us, is that he respects us, is that he embraces us, and that he is, and he heals us too, because that happens at the encounter too, you know? And so it's a very beautiful uh, time, moment that in the gospel. Um, I always, um, that passage is so powerful for me because in a way when, when I see the Samaritan woman, I see myself there too, encountering this God that comes to embrace me as I am and my weaknesses and my brokenness and my woundedness and my miseries and my sinfulness in everything. And he loves me as I am. And the only thing that he seems to care about is her love for him. The only thing that he wants is to be loved. And then we understand that by this encounter that takes place between the Samaritan woman and Jesus, this God has the same fundamental needs that we also have. It seems like those two fundamental 
needs, human needs, to love and to be loved come from God himself. This is a God that wants to love, and this is a God that wants to be loved. He wants to be possessed, and he wants to possess us. And the only way that that can happen is in love, divine love. That's where the encounter takes place. So this is what spiritual direction is all about, you know. It's opening, opening up with your struggles. One of the things, I think that the reason why um, the menstrual treat has been so successful and has transformed so many lives, so many guys, you know, the lives of so many guys, it's been in, in, incredible to see the growth um, of many of you because that what happened at the well between Jesus and the Samaritan woman has happened at the fire pit uh, during the men's retreat. When, when we are there, we, we become the most vulnerable. We become are the most fragile people, not only before the Lord, but with one another. And this is, this is so powerful. This is so amazing. Um, I've been doing all the talking, but I don't know if anybody wants to interact or does anybody have any questions or anything like that so far or... Um, or should I continue? Yes, people have questions, thoughts. Okay. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm listening. I just, I know that sometimes folks need to be a little bit given a, a moment and, and poked and prodded a little bit. I can just see Chris looking like he has something to say right now. <laughs> no, Jericho, how about you, buddy? Um, yeah, I just really like that part about the Samaritan woman, like, God doesn't just want to embrace the good parts of our hearts, but he wants to embrace all of our hearts, even in our brokenness, our sinfulness and misery. So this is very encouraging to hear. I think uh, one of the biggest lessons that I, I learned later in life, which I learned earlier, Father, that you hit on perfectly was that uh, all he wanted was her love he didn't want her to be beat up for her five husbands he didn't want her to to dwell on that and to 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 just beat herself up he didn't he he like went past that and just wanted her love and and i it took me a long time to figure that out that you know not worthy we call it pride whatever you know and uh a lot of the uh, retreat helped that too uh the things that were shared you know it allowed me to see that all men have the same, uh, same struggles, pretty much, as far as what uh, the, the devil throws at us. He's not that clever as far as tools that he uses. So he uses the same, same almost five tools against us. But uh, the biggest one that we have to fight that is what you just said, Father, is that uh, Jesus looks at us differently. He looks yes, at our totally struggles. Different. Yeah, he looks at our struggles as a place to become another success another another victory whereas we look at it, our struggles as i'm i'm not worthy and i'm a and, and terrible person you know whatever and he's like no and i'm a fail failure yes when we look yes. at yes i am a failure yes okay yeah. the other thing that happens also to, which is incredible and is very powerful there too even though it's not explicit in the gospel there is a process that is taking place. I mean, there is a lot of things that are going on in that text. It's a very beautiful, powerful thing. And every time that um, Lent comes around, that's one of the gospels that we read because um, we are preparing for um, Easter. And so there are people that are preparing to receive the sacraments at the Easter vigil. So that gospel is always read when we have the scrutinies. 
And so it's, it's been an incredible journey for me because every time that we come to that moment in the life of the church, um, I am always enlightened by this text and I always learn something new and I, I am able to dive into something totally different, but um, it, it, is, it is very beautiful. So um, I already described some of the things um, and I'm not going to repeat them, of course, because we see there that this God is hungry for relationships. This God communicates love. This God wants friendships or friendship with us. But also, uh, what is taking place there between Jesus and the Samaritan woman is healing. Healing. So when Jesus tells the woman that she has had five husbands and the one that she has right now is not her husband, she goes bananas. Because this is who this God is. He's able to see us through. He sees everything in us. He sees the good. He sees the bad. He sees everything. He knows everything. He knows the most hidden secrets. He knows the, the uh, darkest secrets in our lives. Because he's God. He knows everything about us. And one of the things that he wants to do is that he wants to heal us. And of course, that is a process, you know. So one of the things that happens there when Jesus tells the woman that uh, she has had five husbands and the one that she has right now is not her husband, what does she do? She goes, she runs into town, and she tells the people what has happened. She's sharing the encounter that she had with Jesus. Okay? Why? because her encounter with the Lord has transformed her life. Because she doesn't want to keep this for herself, but she wants other people to know about it. So in a way, what she's doing, she's evangelizing. She's bringing the good news to other people. She wants others to know about this Jesus. And that's why, we cannot keep our mouth shut when we know the Lord and we need to share the Lord because that's one of the effects of encountering the Lord Jesus. That you are so filled, you are filled with so much joy that, that you cannot contain it. You need, to, you need to share it with the world. You need to bring it to the world. You have to share it with everybody because what has happened to you is something extraordinary. The other thing that is very powerful is, like I already said, I already mentioned this also, but Jesus, um, and this is a confession, you know, <laughs> she, God sees our faults and God sees through everything that we have. And in order for the healing process to take place, you have to recognize your sin. You have to recognize your fault. You have to recognize your wrongdoings. You have to recognize your frailties, your brokenness, your woundedness. Because if you don't recognize your failures and your sinfulness, Healing is not going to take place. Healing is not going to happen. So in other words, you have to face yourself. You have to see yourself as you are. And you need to say, this is who I am. And change will not take place unless you're able to see the truth in yourself. One of the things that we find here in this book is this.
No truth can be found unless there is a search for meaning, recognition of human vulnerability and limitation. Relationships with trust to spiritual friends and openness to the disclosure of the transcendent mystery of God before whom all questions cease. Spiritual directors can direct only when there are seekers who come with a question. Without a struggle, the help offered is considered vain. We discover realities that cannot be controlled. And we realize that our hope is hidden, not in the possession of power, but in the confession of weakness. It is right there, you know. That's why this whole process of the um, uh, 10 years of doing this incredible thing, when we started doing this 10 years ago in 2011, the first men's retreat, I never figured, I never, I never thought, I never knew that it was going to develop into this thing because I think that God has guided us to be where we are right now. And he put the things there in place that needed to be, done, to be there for transformation, healing, uh, friendship, um, spiritual friendship will take place amongst you guys. So I think that we have been led by the spirit of the Lord without knowing about it at the beginning, I think. So that's why we are here today doing this thing and want to keep doing this, hopefully for many more, many more years to come. Spiritual guidance affirms the basic quest for meaning. It calls for the creation of space in which the validity of questions that not depend on the availability of answers, but on the question's capacity to open us to new perspectives and horizons. To be recognized as an essential part of the spiritual quest. When we realize that the pain of the human search is necessary, growing pain, we can accept as good the forces of human spiritual development and be grateful for the journey on the long walk of faith. Any more questions? Questions or comments? Questions or comments? I think we're off to a great start. That was really good how many uh father how many um persons does for example yourself or other priests um able to be spiritual directors for and are they always are they always having to be priests can who others qualify as spiritual directors okay so um, in order to be a spiritual director, of course, you have to have a, you have to be a person of faith. You have to be trained to be a spiritual director. There are courses that are being offered for people to be spiritual directors. Not only priests can be spiritual directors, but also other people can be spiritual directors. Like we have nuns or sisters, and we have Protestant ministers that are spiritual directors. And within the Catholic Church, we also have lay people. But of course, you have to be credited. You have to have a course. You have to go to school to do spiritual direction. Um, how many people can you have um, uh, to, do, uh, to be spiritual director of? As many people as you can handle, I guess. Um, well, no, it doesn't have to be a formal relationship, OK? Uh, the only thing, he describes it very well in the book at the beginning. I think that was the first thing that I said today. Um, you have to be open, really, 
is a relationship initi initiated by a spiritual seeker who finds a matter, um, I'm sorry, a mature person of faith willing to pray and respond with wisdom and understanding to his or her questions about how to live spiritually in a world of ambiguity and distraction. Okay. Um, I was listening last night actually to a sister, uh, she's from Chile, and she was talking about this thing. And there were 10 um, characteristics of friendship. Um, and I don't remember right, right now all of them, you know, but one of the things um, that she started out with was that, um, and I can apply that to um, spiritual direction, but she was basically talking about um, Christian friendship. So how the Bible understands friendship, okay? And she said that um, friendships are not the eros. The eros is not part of a friendship. And what is the eros? Remember, it's a Greek word, and it's, the eros is the most passional part of ourselves is the sexual part of ourselves so in this case we are seeking to be friends spiritually with the person we are going to, we are not called to have a sexual intercourse with that person and that's one of the distinctions that she made about friendship real Christian godly friendship, okay? So there has to be a distinction there and there has, there has to be clarity about it. Uh, so what we are looking for is the good of the other. We're looking for the goodness of the other person and the good of the other person. We are going to, in this relationship, we are going to help the other person discover who, who or she is in the presence of God, to bring that person to the feet of the Lord Jesus. That's one of the expressions that Luke uses in his gospel. And that's an expression of discipleship. To bring to, when people are at the feet of the Lord Jesus, is that they are disciples of Jesus. That's a, a typical expression of looking his gospel of discipleship. So that's what spiritual direction and friendship is. And of course, there has to be trust because if there is not trust, then you cannot uh, do this thing, you know? You have to open up, you have to take the risk. And it's very difficult. Uh, there, ha there has to be empathy between the spiritual director and the person that is seeking spiritual direction. Because if there is not trust and empathy, then it cannot take place. So basically, I, I hope that I answered that question. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any more questions? You guys are so quiet. Come on. Uh -huh. Ask questions. I like questions. I don't have a, a question, but I do have a comment. Um, earlier you were talking and you mentioned um, that God is, that we were, because we were created in the image of God, we have this need to be loved and to love back. And that God has that same desire that he has a need to be loved and to be, and to give love. I, that, that, that was really, that was really powerful. Um, just to think about us, it, it makes you feel, I don't know, like, you know, those that your desires are like his, you know, you feel like he's your father when you know that you feel like that, that closeness with him when you know he has the same desires and the same, um, you know, the same, the same longings as you do. So that was touching. <sighs> Yeah, remember that this God, um, the way that we Catholics understand this God is that he is fully human. He's 100% a human being. And as a human being, he has, he's equal to us in everything but sin. The letter to the Hebrews says that, that he is equal to us in everything but sin. 
But he has longings. He has desires. He has thoughts. He has feelings. He has all those things that we humans do have. And that's a very good thing uh, that you're saying. Why? Because in order for him to redeem us and to save us, he had to be totally human, totally like us, in order to redeem the human nature. Because otherwise, our faith in him would be in vain. He would be another God that is up there somewhere that is that cannot relate to us because because he doesn't feel he doesn't think he doesn't act like us so that's the beauty of the incar of the mystery of the incarnation that this god takes on our human condition when he becomes a human being is that is a powerful thing yes Amen. There's a, a very powerful book called The Seven Longings of the Human Heart. It's so funny, Father, because I can't tell you how many times I've uh, I've almost bought that book for you. I was like, hey, he's so busy. He's not going to, he wouldn't read it. But probably for like two years, because in fact, I was slacking with McKinsey while you were talking today. And I'm like, he's, he's preaching the seven longings of the human heart. Um, because uh, <laughs> in that book, the, Mike Bickle talks about how um, how that there's these seven longings. And he says, this isn't comprehensive, but this is just kind of a ca categorically these seven longings that we have. And he says, you're going to try to fulfill these longings one way or another. And, and yet God's designed us that when we fulfill those longings in that in intimacy with him, that there's uh, um, an exhilaration that takes place that, that God makes us hungry with our longings, the way it's funny, the, the only example I can think of right now is um, our dog, you know, we're having a train angel. And so we don't just like let her eat whenever we have to let her get hungry, we have to let her long for that food, we'll see her start searching for that food, so that when we finally do feed her, she eats it all in one setting type of thing. But it's like the Lord uh, gives us these longings so that he can fulfill them. And it's this level of intimacy that when we find that um that fulfillment in him we're, we're exhilarated you know and so much so that one of the examples in the bible is that we're his bride and he's our husband i mean the greatest form of yeah uh, you know anyways but you, it was so powerful so powerful okay so um not too long ago i think it was like a week or two weeks ago um the church was celebrating the 50th anniversary um that uh, Teresa of Avila uh, was proclaimed a doctor of the church. And so the Pope, um, Francis, spoke about it. And one of the things that he said um, in the homily or the talk that he delivered about that, celebrating the 50th um, anniversary of her becoming a doctor of the church, was the incredible, amazing, powerful um, gift that she had to be in prayer. She was a woman that understood very well her relationship with God and these desires, because she was a very passionate person. Um, there were some theologians and some people, historians that were talking about her that I heard one time that if she didn't become what she was, a great mystic contemplative powerful prayer person in the history of the church, she would have been the worst prostitute in Spain because she had that, that kind of personality. And uh, she was a very strong, she had a very strong personality and she was resolved to do whatever God want, wanted her to do in her life. You know, she um, she's the one that uh, became one of the great reformers of the contemplative sisters of the Carmelites. We have a convent here in Salt Lake City of the Carmelite sisters. And the reason why they live the life that they live is because of what she did five, over high 500 years ago. And so, 
she understood that she couldn't live her life without Jesus. And the only way that she was able to have Jesus was in prayer. And she understood this relationship very well that Mackenzie was um, stressing on, commenting on, is that she understood that Jesus wanted to possess her. And because Jesus wanted to possess her, to possess her soul, her being, her, her everything, her vulnerability, her meekness, um, passions, everything that she was, she wanted to possess him as well. It's very interesting that we're talking about this because that's what the readings for the last couple of days had been um, during daily mass. It's about love. This God is about love. And this God is passionate for us. And when he, Jesus says, and the gospel for this weekend is so amazing, it's powerful. And so Jesus says, um, you know, love one another as I have loved you. And as, I, as the Father has loved me, and I love the Father, that's how I want you, the disciples, to love one another. One of the things that we see there is that this God wants, wants us to have the same relationship that the divine persons in the Holy Trinity have. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, although the text only says the Father and the Son, but the love that they have for each other is the Holy Spirit, and that's how we understand the Holy Spirit in the relationship of the Father and the Son, is that this God is so incredible, this God is so amazing, this God is so powerful, that this relationship within themselves, he wants to share that relationship, and he wants the disciples to have the same relationship that the divine persons have. This is amazing. Why? Because this God is opening the door so we humans are able to be part of God's love. And therefore, we become partakers of divine love because this God opened the door for us so we can share in his love. So we, we become sharers of the divine love of God. This is a very powerful, beautiful thing. Why? Because now humans can enter into the mystery of God. Something that has never happened in human history. No other God of any other religion has ever allowed his followers or her followers, whatever the case is, to be in a relationship with, with himself, with God himself, the way our Christian God wants us to be. This is incredible. So in a way, we don't have to go to eternity or to die to be loving God. We can bring the reality of love like it has been shown in the lives of the saints in the Catholic Church. So we can bring the reality of heaven to earth through love. Amen. I, I love that. You know, as you're talking about it, I'm thinking about how um, over the years you, you encounter folks and they have varying levels of intimacy in their relationship with God. And so like, if you, if you look at the, in the old Testament, it was almost as though, although like King David and, and many of the prophets had had a relationship with God in a way, the, the law was like this way of understanding God, God's, his, his yeses, his nos, how we should interact with him, almost like God as a government. You know, people say things like, well, the government says this, like in America, the government says this. And, and it's like this, the government's kind of like an, an entity uh, unto itself. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, the government, well, who, who is the government? But, it, but God is like, is, is what you're saying is, is he's opened up. It's, it's more than just his do's and don'ts, this God from afar. The, he desires this intimate interactive relationship that's deep it's not just a bunch of do's and don'ts it's it's interesting in the um in the international house of prayer 
um, where we do 24 seven, you know, prayer and, and worship. One of the things that is taught there a lot is that um, it's difficult to want to pray if you don't understand how much God loves you, you know, that, that, that uh, who wants to spend time, you know, hours a day in prayer with God, if God's just this mean judge, <laughs> you know, who's a, a bunch of do's and don'ts. But, and, and, and so that's one of the things that um, where that, that bridal paradigm that the Lord has given us comes in that understanding that his love is so great for us, that intimacy he desires um, allows us to want to spend that time with him who doesn't want to spend the time you know with with a with a lover with someone who loves you and is passionate for you and you're right that's like a a big difference between the god who's far off right who's just a bunch of do's and don'ts rights and wrongs versus that what you said he opened that door to relationship to intimacy to to passion for us it's beautiful it's a I read an analogy like uh, it was a, a public speaker and uh, he was he could blend in with the crowd and people would open up to him. But as soon as they found out he was the public speaker, they were like, oh, and they would step back. And what Jesus did was allowed you to be personal, right? Like the allowed to be with God as, as a person, as, as approachable, as approachable, like and it allowed God to be amongst the people as well right like approachable not 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 god and it's like you're saying stand off and you know and then the awe of god it allowed god to be approachable jesus was god approachable walking with and who did he walk with right who did he walk with you know it wasn't the the kings and everything who was jesus walking he's walking with the what i think is i consider myself you know he walked with the the lower side of society right not not the people And, and I love that approachable. He made God approachable, right? You know, Jeff, oh, I'm sorry, Father. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say uh, one more thing or two more things. Um, so when you're doing the spiritual direct direction and when you are the spiritual director, um, one of the things that you bring to that relationship between you and the person that is seeking spiritual direction um, Hopefully by opening up and showing who you are, like I was already talking about the relationship between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, you know, Uh, when you become vulnerable, when you are the weakest, when you are able to, when people are able to see through you, you know, um, you become the most authentic the more transparent, the most sincere person. And that will make you humble. And when you go through that process, and when you, are, when you allow yourself to become vulnerable so others can see the, who you are, then you are being witness to the truth. What is Jesus doing with the Samaritan woman? Is exactly that. What is, she, what is happening with her when Jesus tells her that she has had five husbands? He reveals who she is, right? So at that moment, she becomes the more transparent, she becomes the most sincere and she becomes the most authentic human being because it is in her vulnerability. Now she she is humbled. She's a humble person. And the truth, not only about her, but about God can be seen. And no, hopefully she's able to see that the text doesn't say that to us, of course, but we are reading from, from a distance what's happening in, in that encounter that is taking place between her and Jesus. But also as an spectator of what is taking place, you can see that. So 
when you're doing a spiritual direction, hopefully other people can recognize that you're authentic, that you're sincere, and that you are honest. And when you are that, then they're able to see the truth. Then you are real. You're not fake. You're real. Because you're dealing with the, with the most, um, with the weakest things about yourself. You, you are being a real person. You're real at that moment. It's, and, and I think that that's a very powerful thing. So in order to do spiritual direction, that needs to take place in the process. That's what I wanted to say. The, the same thing that happened to the Samaritan woman was somewhat parallel with what happened to Mary Magdalene, too. She was, uh, um, you know, selling her body, and and she was, of course, being accused of that, and and how how Jesus turned that whole circumstance on on his head by causing those who were the um, purchasers of her uh, body and accused and realize the guilt that they uh, that they had uh, established and, and she becomes like the Samaritan woman uh, um, one who does not feel condemned one who's uh, suddenly uh, loved for who she was and not for what she, not her Eros aspect of that that she spoke to earlier that that uh, sister you from Chile uh, had spoken about. That, that, um, the authentic love came forth from him and, and then ultimately from her because she became probably one of the first and greatest of the disciples in terms of understanding who he was uh, far, far sooner than the men did. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and the love that she showed uh, the appreciation of, uh, of her, you know, is, is just so radiates throughout the, the encounter of her with Jesus. I did, I just wanted to add it also that uh, Father, like you were saying, uh, when when you realize that God knows everything about you, when you honestly accept that and realize that there is so much freedom there, you know, when you realize that God knows everything about you, when you actually ponder that and accept it and internalize that and know that there's nothing hidden, that is such a freedom. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, that's one of the things that I have witnessed at the fire pit, at the retreat. At the retreat. Um, when people stand up and go up to the fire pit and they open up themselves, uh, that's when people become the most real, the most vulnerable. We have already spoken about that too but that humbles you. And when you, it's, it's like a breakthrough, you know? So when you see, when you let others come into the mystery of who you are, not only God, but also others, because it is a process, you know? And that's why the church did uh, communal confessions at the beginning. So when you went to confession, actually, you had to do, in, to do it in front of everybody. That's how confessions were. At the beginning of the history of the church, believe it or not, it was like that. Because that's, the, the, the early church really understood this very, very well. Uh, because that's how you become who you are. 
you know? And one of the things that the book says also here about um, this spiritual direction is when all of that happens, you know, you become a witness of life to your friends. And really the word weakness become, it means martyr. That's the original sense of the word. To be weakness means to offer your own faith experience and to make your doubts and hopes, failures and successes, loneliness and woundedness available to others as a context in which they can struggle with their own humanness and quest for meaning. That's what spiritual direction is all about, you know? Uh, spiritual direction means to listen to the other without fear and to discover the intimate divine connections within your own stormy life history. It means to help others discover that their questions are human questions. Their search is a human search and their restlessness is part of the restlessness of the human heart, you don't include it. Beautiful, that is very powerful. Another miracle, Father, has occurred, always occurs at the, the fire pit. And I say this for those that have not been to a men's retreat and, and, and this is the, this is the most important part that after uh, that vulnerability is exposed and all, the increase of relation, the relationship increases between everyone there exponentially. Mm -hmm. Instead of being the feeling like you will be condemned or um, Think whatever the, yeah. All of a sudden, it's just the opposite. It's just like Jesus himself with the Samaritan woman. Um, you're loved all the more, not the less. And that's that's the real miracle. It is it, that that it, that it's it's the it's the us coming to the well each time. Mm -hmm. And and that to me has always been the most powerful. And for people like Devin and, and Jericho um, um, come to the retreat. Um, it is the most freeing that Jeff talked about that one will ever experience. You know, you know, Go ahead. And on that, that point, we, uh, we're all brothers, right? When you walk away from that evening event, we're, uh, we're all unity, you know? There's a, there's something happens there. There's a a page is turned in that retreat, and we go back to our lives. And you know, as Father mentioned, that after retreat, that we got to keep that flame going, right? But after that event, and I don't want to give it all away for for the for the newbies. But after that event, the page turns, and we're no longer uh, like separate beings anymore. We're we're uh, unified. You know, after Amen. that after that event. At least that's the way I feel. Uh, I mean, our prayers, things we've done, and listening to our voices and the miracle that happened there on that on that one retreat, mm -hmm. our voices joined in one, sounding like thunder, yeah. praying the Our Father. We we are no longer single individuals at that point. We're a combined body. Amen. Hey, uh, Devin and Jericho, this is the retreat they're talking about this year. It's the 100 Years of Fire Retreat, the Flame Keepers 11th Annual Men's Retreat, August 13th through 15th in Bloomington, Idaho. Um, and it's it's off the chain. We, we head to Bloomington, Idaho, and uh, we camp out and people, we have trailers and 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 barbecues and and all kinds of spiritual activity all day long, but it's very intense. Um we leave on a Friday, come back on a Sunday, and it's uh, it's off the chain. Um, very cool. So also, Father, just to wrap this up, um, I, as you were sharing today, I was just taking some quick notes. You know, you mentioned solitude. What, one of the things that you're talking about in spiritual direction in this book, if we go to this, this Henry Nowen book, is, you know, he talks about three different spiritual disciplines, prayer, the word of God, and then the, the community of faith and relationships. 
And that's really what, for those who are joining us on YouTube, what, what, what Flame Keepers is all about. We're a group that's dedicated to catechesis, to, to helping each other grow in spiritual disciplines. And, um, you know, Father, you mentioned, um, uh, talked about the Word of God. And one thing that we do a lot, you know, we pray the rosary every day when you go to our, our, our Zoom calendar. But we actually, um, one thing that we found is, is that we come together and anyone's welcome to join us. Our 6 a.m. Zoom rosary, you can actually click on that link at 5.30, we read the Bible together every day. In fact, Devin and I get there at five and then other people come in at 5.30 and we, we're reading the Bible every single day. But in the midst of spending time reading the Bible and praying together, you were, you were mentioning getting the word of God through mass. You know, you don't have to just go to mass. If you're at work, you can get online and go to daily mass, daily TV mass on YouTube. I know that a, a number of us in the Flame Keepers have made it a habit to, uh, to, if you can't make it to daily mass, to listen to daily mass on YouTube and get the word of God um, that way. And you, you, know, you talked about the, the need to exercise our, our spiritual life amidst the community of faith. And so just a reminder for everybody, if you wanna connect relationally with people, you come to the Flame Keepers website and, and there's ways to connect. If you go to our events page, uh, we have what we call, this won't, this won't stay now, but we have what we call power pods. In fact, we have one that we have a power pod today. It's basically our form of a small group. Um, in fact, a handful of us from this, this Zoom meeting will be meeting at, uh, at Chris's house and uh, Father Dominic will be joining us, but we just get together and we kind of just talk about our uh, spiritual disciplines and how things are going. And each person kind of just gets to share how's their walk with God going. And Father, you are hosting a, um, a, a, potluck at your house this coming not this weekend but next weekend may 16th so jericho i don't know if you're available but we would love to see you uh at this right here uh 5 p.m at father vidal's house this coming sunday just an opportunity to plug in with people and get more connected and get energized in uh your spiritual life if you're looking for that we'd love to have you so father thank you so much can we uh um, Bob, could you, would you like to close us in prayer? Or, Father, I don't want to step on your toes if you had more to add, but I just thank you so much for being up. I know you got to get ready for mass soon, I, I assume. Yeah. Okay. Bob? Uh, okay. All right. Oh, wait, one last thing. So two Fridays from now, we'll be here again two Fridays from now, 5.30 a.m. The Zoom links are in the calendar for those of you who want to join us. Or you can sign up for an email reminder uh, at the events page. Go down and, and, and do that. Um, so two weeks from now, Father, is there a portion of the book that they can, that we can read so that we're, uh, we're just kind of getting started with these? You covered the preface today. How far uh, into the book for those of us who have it? And he did chapter one, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we should read the book through chapter, the first couple of chapters. Okay, so the, 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 what I did was chapter one, and then I'm going to start doing chapter two. Where do I begin? That's the title on it. So we are going to do just that because there is so much here. Um, of course, those chapters are very, very um, short, but I think... If we try to cover too much of it, we are going to miss a lot of stuff. Yeah, because so good. It's um, deep. Huh? So Jericho, are you going to be at Mass by chance this Sunday? Yeah, um, I'll try to make it. Okay. Well, gra grab a book from us. We'll have a book in the back for you uh, on that. And, yeah, and then you can. And for those locally here at St. Mary, uh, as I already said to Jose and Jerry and Jay, uh, likewise, Kevin, I'll bring... Um, uh, a copy of the uh, the book I have and uh, give it to you uh, at mass. Okay. Awesome. All right, Bob, do you mind closing us in prayer? No. My in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, Holy gracious father, this has been a, uh, a wonderful uh, introduction to another great retreat that you are fashioning and hosting for us, Lord. And uh, we look forward to uh, renewing our relationships with men of the past that have been to other retreats and acquiring new relationships of new persons that will become our spiritual friends. And um, we give you thanks, Lord, that uh, you have created community for the purpose of sharing love and that your love can 
flow to us through that in that type of uh, relationship, that type of environment. Uh, if it were just between us and you all the time, while it's tremendous, it becomes even more powerful when when we can share the love amongst each other. And we we thank you, Lord, that that uh, what Satan meant for bad during this past year, uh, you had meant for good. And out of that is a new way that we can relate to one another, even though we're not maybe physically connected. But uh, in this manner, we are definitely connected uh, uh, in a pseudo physical way, but spiritually, even all the more. And we thank you, Lord, for these abilities to happen. And thank you for Father Vidal and his uh, ever um, powerful messages that you have spoken through him so many times in the past and again today. We thank you, Lord, for all those who attended today this uh, in this um, meeting room. And uh, Lord God, we just ask you to expand this and, and help it to grow spiritually, uh, um, dynamically and, and directly. Lord God, we give you all the praise and glory and, and, uh, and the love that uh, we, uh, we seek of you. In Christ's name, we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Amen.